Hello. Today, we are talking about the biggest emerging infection of all, HIV and AIDS. This story is recounted in part in this really neat book. I highly recommend The Origin of AIDS by Jacques Pepin. This fellow was a physician who practiced in rural Africa, and he traces the origin, and I use a lot of his discussion in today's lecture. And this quote is really great. It's from the introduction. The tra this tragedy, referring to the AIDS pandemic, was facilitated or even caused by human interventions, colonization, urbanization, and probably well-intentioned public health campaigns. We'll explore this a little bit today. You know, in every emerging infection, there's always something that we do to facilitate the introduction of a new virus into us. This one in particular, the circumstances are particularly egregious, as you'll see. This story begins in 1981 with a short note in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is is issued weekly by the CDC. It's free. Highly recommend it. You can get it by email. And this was pneumocystis pneumonia in Los Angeles. From October to May 81, five young men, all active homosexuals, were treated for biopsy-confirmed pneumocystis pneumonia at three different hospitals in Los Angeles. Two of the patients died. All five had laboratory-confirmed cytomegalovirus infection and candidal mucosal infection. So this was a case report of these five unusual situations, five apparently healthy young men coming down with infections that only very sick people usually have. For example, pneumocystis pneumonia is almost exclusively limited to severely immunosuppressed patients. So this was really unusual that these individuals had it and were dying of it. And they say here, all the above observations suggest the possibility of a cellular immune dysfunction related to a common exposure that predisposes individuals to opportunistic infections. So they didn't say it was an infectious disease, but it was something that they were exposed to. The implication is an infectious disease. So this was the first recognition that something was going on, 1981. The physicians who made this report were really very prescient in, in thinking about what was going on. At the same time, in many other cities, throughout the US, there were similar clusters of pneumocystis pneumonia and Kaposi's sarcoma. This is a cancer which can often be seen in the form of lesions on the skin, but the cancer is also inside as well. It's not just a skin cancer. And this is a rare cancer as well, very rarely seen in the US. Mostly before this, in old Mediterranean men. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So based on these reports from LA, San Francisco, New York, the CDC realized something was going on. They established what they called a case definition. So they said, if you see Kaposi's sarcoma or opportunistic infections, then you should tell us, because this is highly unusual that these are happening in clusters. For the next year or so, this disease was called GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, because many people thought it was only spread among homosexuals. At some point in 1982, it was finally renamed AIDS because it was found to be also transmitted from mother to child at birth. It was transmitted heterosexually, and it was transmitted via blood products. This is a really dark, time in the history of infectious disease in this country where many people said this is a gay disease and we don't have to deal with it. In fact, Ronald Reagan, who was president at the time, would not mention this disease until his buddy Rock Hudson died of it. Really pathetic. And then finally it started to get the attention and the research money that it deserved. Turned out that the virus was isolated in 1983 from the lymph node of a patient in Paris with lymphadenopathy, swollen lymph nodes. This is one of the features of an infection, right? The APCs go into the lymph node and the B and T cells start proliferating. 
And that was done by Montagnier and Barre Sinoussi. They got the Nobel Prize in 2008 for that. So as soon as you have the virus, you can make a blood test. You can look for antigens, viral antigens or antibodies, and you can start seeing who is infected. This isolating of the virus, well, of course, we could sequence it and we could look at it in the electron microscope, and it was revealed to be a lentivirus, which is a known group of retroviruses. On the upper right is an electron micrograph of an HIV particle. You can see an unusual kind of cone-shaped nucleocapsid that's diagrammed on the left. This is different from some of the other retroviruses that we have been looking at so far. So what is a lentivirus? Retrovirus is a family designation, and it has been divided into genera, which are shown here. Here is lentivirus genus down here with the HIVs. There are two different types, one and two. And just to kind of orient you, we have been talking about avian leukosis virus and rouse sarcoma virus in this course, remember. These are what are called alpha retroviruses. These are genera. The HTLVs, the other human retroviruses are delta retroviruses, and the fish retrovirus, the walleye, dermal sarcoma virus is an epsilon retrovirus. So that is a separate group that we, separate from the other retroviruses we've talked about so far in this course. And now we know there are two different kinds of human retroviruses. There are the lymphotropic retroviruses, which were discovered just before HIV. There are four different types. Human T lymphotropic virus, one, two, three, and four. And then, of course, the immunodeficiency viruses, there are HIV one and two. These were immediately recognized to be lentiviruses because others had been studying lentiviruses before of other animals. There was a horse lentivirus, called equine e infectious anemia virus, which causes immunosuppression of horses. That was isolated in the early 1900s. There were feline immunodeficiency viruses already known. So this idea that a virus, a lentivirus, could immunosuppress humans so they would get these unusual opportunistic infections was not new. We'd seen it before in other animals. And many people made the connection and that's why this field went forward in part. Here is a picture of an HIV particle. It is a typical retrovirus with an envelope full of glycoproteins. In it is a nucleocapsid. The nucleocapsid has a different shape from the Rouse sarcoma virus and the avian leukosis viruses that we've been talking about so far. It's, it's, it's uh, elongated, as you can see. But the genome is a plus-stranded RNA, two copies of the genome, and of course, that genome is reverse transcribed to form a provirus, which is shown at the bottom. Provirus is integrated into the host cell DNA, two LTRs on either side, and it encodes the GAG proteins, the structural proteins, the Paul proteins, the reverse transcriptase, integrase, RNASH, and the envelope, just like Rouse and other retroviruses that we've talked about so far, but in addition, encodes all these little proteins, TAT, REV, VIF, VPR, VPU, et cetera. And that's why we call these retroviruses with complex genomes, because Rouse and avian leukosis don't encode all these little proteins. We've talked a little bit about what they do. One of these proteins is responsible for export of unspliced RNAs, viral RNAs from the nucleus. Others are involved in suppression of innate responses. So they, that makes these viruses unique compared to other retroviruses. So the name AIDS, of course, stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. A syndrome is a group of characteristic symptoms that always occur together. So initially it was called a syndrome because we weren't quite sure what was causing it. And there's no question that HIV-1 is the etiologic agent of AIDS. You may know that there are people in the world called AIDS denialists, just like there are anti-vaxxers. I hear often from AIDS denialists who tell me why it's never been proven that HIV causes AIDS. There are people out there who 
subscribe to this theory and they acquire AIDS and they don't get treated and they die as a consequence. But it's been proven beyond doubt that HIV causes AIDS because in the early years of the outbreak, it was spread by contaminated blood. People who needed blood products got contaminated blood, they were infected and they all died. There's zero reason to be an AIDS denialist nowadays. And the people that do so are in the same category as the anti-vaxxers. So there's no question that HIV causes AIDS. Let's go through a few statistics first. I wanna show you the impact of this infection globally. Let's start with the US. These are the latest statistics. It takes a while for these to get into the system. So 2016 is what we have at the moment on the CDC website. The US HIV has killed over 600,000 people, which is more Americans killed in all the wars in the 20th century, World War I, II, Korean War, Vietnam. It's more than that. It's quite amazing. Over 1.2 million are living with HIV at the moment in the US. 13% of those don't know it. And that's a problem because they can spread it to other people. In 2016, there were 39,782 new infections, most of them in men. And half of the infections in the US happen in people, young people. You can look at the lower left graph. Here is the 2016 infections broken down by age group. You can see the most in the 20 to 29 and the 30 to 39 age group. And then we can divide it further according to uh, what kind of cohort has been involved. So here on the right-hand graph, we have men in yellow, women in blue. And you can see uh, in the different racial groups, we have male-to-male -male sexual contact responsible for most of the transmission. In women, black women and white women, heterosexual contact results in transmission uh, from men mostly. And then uh, there are heterosexual contacts in uh, black men. So you can see different modes of transmission, but the most is in male-to-male uh, -male contact. Globally, there are currently six, 37 million people living with HIV. And in 2016, 1.8 million newly infected people and 1 million HIV-related deaths. Here's a breakdown of the numbers of 36.7 million because I want you to see in particular how many kids less than 15 years of age are already infected. Some of them acquire it by sexual activity, but the vast majority got infected at birth from their mothers. So they had no say in this infection. They got it because their mothers were HIV positive. And again, this is the total number of children less than 15 years old, 2.1 million. Newly infected children, 160,000, and deaths, 120,000. So these are real tragedies because their lives are interrupted. The region is important. This is not infecting everyone globally. The vast majority of infections are in Africa, and in particular in sub-Saharan Africa. 25 million out of those 37 million, uh, followed by Southeast Asia, the Americas, Europe. We have made an impact on the HIV incidence and mortality since discovering this infection in the 80s. So in blue are people newly infected with HIV globally, and in red are the deaths from HIV globally. So you can see after we discovered the virus in the 80s, there was a rise in the, in the 90s, which peaked around 2000, newly infected people in blue, and then it slowly has been declining to the 2016 year, and you could, so that's good. The peak of death was a little offset from infections because it may take up to 10 or 15 years to die from this infection. And that peaked in 2006 or so and has been declining as well. So we are making inroads in preventing infection and death because we can educate people how not to transmit or acquire infections. And we have antiretrovirals that we can use to treat infection. This is a graph of life expectancy, which is really remarkable. In the vaccine lecture, I showed you how our life expectancy has increased with the use of vaccines and other medicines. Well, here are African countries. We're looking at life expectancy at birth in years on the y-axis from the 80s when AIDS first emerged. And you can see that many of these countries had 
60 year old or so life expectancy, very much like the rest of the world. But look at how it plummeted to 40 years old in some cases, solely because of HIV AIDS, because these countries had the bulk of the burden of infection. Now we are recovering. You can see remarkable recoveries in some of these countries. And that is because we are reducing the number of infections, but they're still below the world average. In 2016, there were 5,000 new infections a day. That is 200 an hour. So right now there was someone infected. And if I wait a few minutes, there'll be another one. It's really amazing how many infections are ongoing. As we talked about before, we do have triple th drug therapy, which can hold HIV infection in check. Cannot cure it ever, but it can hold it so it doesn't progress and you can live a full life. So in countries with money, this is great. The challenge has been getting it to countries without money, bringing down the price and distributing it. And we've made good inroads in that area. These are the estimated numbers of people receiving antiretroviral therapy globally by WHO region. So here on the top graph, people receiving antiretroviral therapy in the millions. And you can see it has been steadily increasing. The African region in red is the most important. They have the most cases and we're hitting them the most. So that's great. But the percentage is not yet there. Look at the bottom graph. This is coverage and percentage. Even though the graph is increasing, it looks great. We're only hitting 40% of people who need ART. So we have a long way to go. These people who aren't covered are going to die. They need to have antiretrovirals to survive. So we've made great inroads. We're making progress. We're not yet there. Many people are working on this. Many people are donating money to this cause, but there's no cure. You cannot clear virus. Once you're infected, you're infected for life because the provirus exists in your cell DNA, and it's in cells that live your life. They're long-lived cells. And so as soon, if you're taking antiretrovirals and you stop, the virus will come back. There's no vaccine, which we really need to block primary infection. But many trials, as I'll mention later, I'm very pessimistic about an HIV vaccine. I'll tell you why later. So you cannot stop taking drugs because there are latent reservoirs in you. There are cells in you that last your lifetime and you can't get rid of them. We get drug resistance as well. Drugs are expensive, although they're coming down in price. All right, so that's very sobering. This is the biggest pandemic that we know of and it arose out of nowhere, apparently. So let's talk a little bit about where it came from. HIV arose out of Africa, it's quite clear. Once we had the virus and we developed blood tests, we could then go around the world and say, who's infected? And the very early studies in Africa, in Zaire, used to be called Zaire, now it's DRC, and Rwanda showed that it was AIDS or HIV infection was very common in the capitals, Kinshasa, and Kigali, up to 90% of sex workers were infected. So this immediately suggested that it originated here. Of course, that didn't prove it, but later we found that other countries had far lower incidences. So this was really an indication that that was the origin. In other words, it had been here the longest, and so it had time, the virus had time to infect a lot of people. Then we started looking for archived samples. We went around the world, and looked in laboratories that had taken sera for different purposes and frozen them and got those. And there were two that were key. There was a serum sample from a DRC adult male and from 1959, that's the earliest we had. And that was positive for HIV. That was found in 1998. And then a DRC adult female, a sample taken in 1960 was also positive. So those are the two earliest samples, and they showed that the virus was present at several places in Central Africa, but it wasn't in Western or Eastern Africa. These two samples differed by about 12% in their genome sequence. So despite their being a year apart, they had drifted quite a bit. And as you will see, people use that drift to calculate when roughly the virus entered humans, and from that, we can say it's in the first decades of the 20th century. We'll come back to that. So there was no doubt that HIV was present in Leopoldville, which was the name of the capital of Zaire at the time, in the late 50s already. 
right? It's a disease that we didn't notice till 1981. It was clearly there, but no one had noticed it. As it's recounted in that book, The Origin of AIDS, there were probably lots of patients with diseases resulting from immunosuppression, but lots of things cause immunosuppression, so no one noticed it in the overall background of illness. All right, so HIV probably arose in the early 1900s. Where did it come from? In uh, 1989, SIV was isolated from chimpanzees. Simian immunodeficiency virus had not been seen before. It's called SIV CPZ. And this virologist, Beatrice Hahn, she uh, headed a team, she's at the University of Pennsylvania, that went to Africa and collected over 7,000 chimpanzee fecal samples from 90 different field sites. So these, here's Central Africa. Each little circle is a separate colony of chimpanzees. They don't mix very much, so they're pretty isolated. She collected fecal samples from all of these. The way they do this is you can't capture a chimpanzee and get a fecal sample. You have to find it on the floor of the forest and make sure it's chimpanzee feces. You can do mitochondrial DNA analysis or they, they used to wait when the, when the chimps woke up in the morning and they sleep up in the canopy. The first thing they do is urinate and they would stand below them and catch their urine and it turned out they could find virus in the urine as well. Amazing effort to say where, is there a virus in chimps that's related to HIV? Now there are a number of different species of chimps. So pan troglodytes is the chimp and then there are subspecies, PTT, PT Schweinfurthi, you can see them all here. Troglodytes, LEOT, Virus, and then there's the bonobos, the pan paniscus. They tested all of these, and the different colors here show the range of these. And the yellow ones were positive for SIV. Only in PTT and PTS did they find SIV at CPZ. So this was most likely the origin of HIV. And sequence analysis of the genome showed clearly that HIV arose from SIV CPZ. That's her in front of the wall of polio, by the way, when it was in my lab. By the way, her daughter took this course about five years ago. She didn't tell me until it was over, though. She had the, she had the name of her husband, Shaw. Uh, Shaw. George Shaw is also a virologist at Penn. And then the next year, she was a TA for this course. And now she's a medical student at Columbia. And that's her mom. She must be proud of her mom, I guess. She figured out the origin of uh, HIV. It's pretty good. SIV is a virus transmitted among chimps by sex. It's also transmitted from mother to child at birth. Chimps fight, and they probably can transmit it during those fights as well. The estimated transmission frequency per coital act is similar to the transmission frequency in humans. And SIV CPZ is pathogenic in chimps. It was thought for a while that it wasn't, that chimps were okay with it, but Jane Goodall, remember the lady who studied chimps, her, her chimps were started to die. And in fact, Beatrice Hahn had established a nice relationship with Jane Goodall, and they would go and take blood from the chimps in her preserves and they would get samples that were SIV positive and they'd go back to her and say, can we get more from this animal? They were all tagged. And she said, no, that animal died that last year. So, so between the two of them, they figured out that this virus was actually killing the chimps. It is pathogenic. And that su should suggest to you that it's not been in chimps for very long. Here's a fi three phylogenetic trees comparing these SIVs with HIVs for three different genes, gag, pollen, and envelope, they all tell you the same thing. And what you can see is that the main group of HIV, HIV-M, it's, it's right, it clusters with SIV, TPZ from PTT. They're right next to each other, clearly have a common ancestor. The, and we'll talk about what these M and N, N mean. Here's HIV-N is clustering also next to PTT. There is uh, HIV, the P group 
is clustering next to a gorilla SIV. So it was also subsequently found in gorillas, again, by Beatrice Hahn. And the O group is also clustering next to gorillas. So this and other analyses clearly showed that these HIVs have common ancestors with closely related viruses in chimps and in gorillas. So here is the final story that emerged from all this really interesting work. In Africa, there are many different kinds of monkeys. They are not non-human primates. They are old world monkeys like the sooty mangabe, vervet, I like the vervet, nice face, mandrills, monas, red cap mangabees. Every one of these monkeys has its own SIV and they are fine with that. They don't get sick from this SIV infection. So people have gone and isolated these SIVs from these different monkeys, and they give them names that reflect their origin. SIV Mon for the Mona, SIV RCM for red cap, and so forth. So every monkey has its own unique SIV. And what studies have revealed is that the chimps and the gorillas got SIV from these monkeys. So here we have, here's PTT that Beatrice Hahn and others has shown transmitted SIV TPZ to humans. That resulted in the M and the N groups of HIV. M means, stands for Maine. This is 99% of all the HIV infections fall under this group. This chimp, PTT, acquired its SIV from two different monkeys, from the red cap and the mona. This virus in chimps is actually recombinant of the mona SIV and the red cap. So apparently that someone got co-infected, the virus recombined, which happens, and the chimp had a recombinant. So this is circulating among those PTT chimps. They transmit it to one another. Maybe for 100 or 200 years or so, it's been in chimps from, from uh, the other monkeys, and then the chimp transmitted this to human. Now, how would this chimp get it from the monkeys? Well, chimps do eat meat. Here's a picture of a chimp eating a, uh, well, some kind of meat there. So they often will fight other monkeys and eat them. So probably they acquired it by doing that. The other transmission of two other groups of HIV came from gorillas. And that gorilla virus, SIV gore, came from SIV CPZ. So maybe a gorilla killed a chimp at some point and acquired the virus that way. And so that is actually a recombinant virus originally acquired from these two monkeys to the chimp and to the gorillas. And so this has all been sorted out by Hans Group and others. So we know now that this human infection, which arose in the 80s and which has now infected so many millions of people, came from chimpanzees and gorillas. When did this happen? These four groups of HIV, M, N, O, and P, are four separate crossovers from chimps or gorillas to humans. It happened four times. The M and the O groups, so the M came from chimps to humans, the O came from a gorilla to humans. These happened sometime in the first three decades of the 20th century. For M in particular, we have the most data anywhere from about 1900 to 1920 that crossover, those crossovers happen. NNP is more recent, but we don't have enough data to pinpoint it. People are still working on that. So this is a virus that's been in humans since maybe 1900, 1920, and only in 1980 did we recognize it doing something. It's very scary in my view. How did this happen? How did the virus get from chimps or gorillas to humans? And this is the hypothesis, it's called the cut hunter hypothesis. Someone was in the woods hunting bushmeat, either chimp, probably not a gorilla because very hard to find them, but you might find a dead gorilla on the, the floor of the forest. And the idea is that the hunter is butchering the meat, the animal in the woods, cut himself or herself and gets infected. The chimp has SIV in its blood. The hunter is cutting, cuts himself, or herself, the, the virus gets in and infects that person. And in the book, The Origin of Eight, he goes through the calculations. He figures, in 1921, the number of people in Africa, in these countries with the chimps, they're only in a certain part of Africa, it was 
with less than 10. And probably only one cut hunter gave rise to the M group of HIV. So that's only one that spread and multiplied. But it's obviously happened many times because each of the four HIV groups are a separate crossover, a separate cut hunter maybe. But this one, the M group, has spread the most. And they're probably still happening. I would guess there are multiple infections of SIV from chimps to humans in Africa because they're still poached, but we don't see it. It doesn't emerge. So why did this one emerge? And this is where it was the perfect storm of events that allowed this one to spread. And it had to do a lot with the colonialization of Africa. Here on the upper left is a graph showing the population growth in main cities in Africa. You know, at around 1880, Africa consisted of small tribal villages. Where people lived in small groups with a chieftain. They didn't intermingle very much. And then, of course, at the end of the 1800s, Europe decided that they owned Africa. And so every country came in and took parts of Africa, and they began to build roads and bridges and railroads. And the population of Africa increased. And it is that increase in population which coincides with the expansion of HIV. This, this gray area is the M group of HIV time to the most recent common ancestor. So that is the, the window where we think SIV jumped into people from you know, 1900 or so to, to 1920. I'm going to say 1920 just to have a, a date from, from now on. So you have Europeans coming in and, in their view, growing Africa. The cities grow. You get large numbers of migrants. You take all these men who lived in little villages, you ship them to big cities, away from their families. Of course, brothels arise then. Then the Europeans say, well, we need to have clinics to treat these people with sexually transmitted diseases. So they have clinics, but they don't sterilize the needles that they use. They use needles over and over in these clinics. So that was this cunt hunter may have gone to a city, visited a brothel, gone to a clinic, Hey, so he infected a woman. He then spread his virus to needles, which then amplified it. And of course, some of the women in these cities had 1,000 clients per year, so that probably contributed to it. And so you can see that this colonization by Europe has really probably contributed to the expansion uh, of not only the population and movement of the population, but the transmission of this virus. There's a particular connection between Haiti and the Belgian Congo. Around the 1960s, the Belgian Congo said, we've had it with the Europeans, get out of here. They're mostly from Belgium. So they left, but then the country was stuck because they had no physicians. They'd all come from Belgium. So they reached out to another French-speaking country, which was Haiti. And many Haitians moved to the former Belgian Congo to be physicians. And you'll see they brought HIV back to Haiti with them when they returned. So European colonization of Africa. You know, here's a map showing you in different colors all the different European countries that took a piece of Africa and tried to develop it. Large labor population centers, movement of males, introduction of health care. And just to illustrate how this works, at the beginning of the 20th century, Egypt wanted to inject its population with drugs to treat schistosomiasis, a parasite infection. They didn't properly sterilize the needles. They spread hepatitis C virus to millions of people. So now a huge fraction of Egypt is HCV infected. Because of this health care move, it was well-intentioned, but you know, they needed to sterilize their needles. So we think all of this led to the amplification of HIV on a scale that never happened before. This is an unprecedented part of history, and it just so happened that the virus was there and it rode along with it. More recently, about two years ago, an, a number of additional HIV samples were sequenced, and these came from outbreaks in Haiti, the east and west coast, and they revealed just what happened to get the virus over here. So the virus arrived in about 1969 to Haiti from Africa. And you can clearly see that by comparing. These are, these are phylogenetic trees of all these isolates. 
So this Haitian strain in yellow is at the root of all the other viruses in the US which are on the remainder of this tree. Remember, that root node, node gives rise to all of the viruses to the right of it. The virus went from Haiti to New York in about 1972, spread to New Jersey and Pennsylvania, it went to Georgia, and then of course it went to California as well. These are some samples from San Francisco. And so that's the Haitian connection. The doctors who had gone to the Belgian Congo came back, they brought HIV with them, they infected the population, and as a resort area there was a lot of traffic between Haiti and New York, and that brought the virus into New York. You may have heard of the famous patient zero, Gaetan Dugas, who was a flight attendant who was supposedly the, the start of the AIDS pandemic in the US. He had lots of sexual partners and he flew all over the place. Well, he's here, patient zero. He didn't really contribute much to the spread of this in the US. He's just another node on this tree. It had already been here and was spreading elsewhere. There's another HIV I wanna mention, HIV-2. First isolated in Guinea-Bissau, this small country on the western coast of Africa. It has 30 to 40% identity with HIV-1, and it's mostly found in West African populations. It is far less virulent than HIV-1. Most infections do not progress to AIDS. It is less transmissible, and there's no mother to infant spread. So this is a highly restricted infection. This is a crossover from a sooty mangabe to humans. So here, it's not a chimp, but it's an earlier reservoir. It's the actual reservoir of these SIVs, the sooty mangabe, and that has happened eight times in Western Africa. There are eight separate lineages of HIV-2 in humans, and each one is a separate crossover from a sooty mangabe into humans. So that's HIV-2. When HIV replicates in so many people, it diversifies because the viral polymerase is error prone. So now we recognize four groups based on sequence alignments. Here's HIV-1. We have group M, N, O, and P. M is the main group. 99% of all HIV infections. Group O is the outlier, less than 1%, limited to a few countries. And groups N and P, all in Cameroon, and only 15 cases that define a group. So those are really interesting because they're separate crossovers. M, O, N, and P are separate crossovers from a chimp or a gorilla. But M is the main one, and that has accounted for 99% of all infections. Because M is so big, it further diversifies into what we call subtypes. So HIV M further diversifies into all these subtypes. There are nine subtypes so far based on sequence alignment. There are also what are called CRFs, circulating recombinant forms. People at high risk for infection, sex workers for example, get multiply infected. The viruses in them recombine and make new viruses which may be more fit than the original two, and they spread in the population, and they have their own subtype designation. There's no real difference as far as we can see in the biology of these. There's some indication that you know, some subgroups, you die faster, there's more shedding and so forth. But the main point about these subtypes is that they represent diversification in a restricted population. The virus is introduced, say, into a specific region of Africa, and it diversifies locally, it becomes a subgroup, because a subtype is just different from what's circulating in New York City. You can actually reconstruct the progress of infection in a particular country by looking at the distribution of subtypes. And in the 90s, we got very good at this because we were able to develop rapid sequencing technologies, and in fact, there have been a number of cases of individuals who intentionally infect women with HIV. Thousands of women, and they don't tell them, of course, that they're HIV infected. And they're, they've been brought to trial, and you can reconstruct and prove that they are the source of the women's HIV by looking at the subtypes that are involved. Now, in Africa, we have the most diversity of HIV in terms of subtypes, which is consistent with it emerging there first. It's had the longest time to diversify in the human population. The key here to understand is that these subtypes show what we call a founder effect. If one subtype goes into a specific group of individuals, it will predominate there. So if, if a, virus, a subtype goes from Haiti, let's say, to New York, 
that subtype will predominate in New York City. And here's an example, subtype B is found in 96% of white homosexuals in South Africa. So it was imported there by an individual, and that individual was a white homosexual, and the virus stays in that group because they associate with each other. Same thing, subtype C, 81% in, in Africa of black heterosexuals. Here's the global distribution, just so you can see the diversity. Southern Africa has mostly group uh, subtype C, the U.S. has mostly subtype B. These are antigenically different. If you want to make a vaccine, you have to take this into consideration. If you want to make a vaccine in the U.S., you would make it against B, but cases of C subtypes are imported, it wouldn't work. So ideally, you want a vaccine that covers everything. Transmission of HIV, the virus is not particularly infectious, far less so than measles, the R0, 2 to 5. It is not spread by respiratory, alimentary, or vector routes. It is spread in the way shown here. And in different countries, the proportion of spread is different. So here in the US, mostly men having sex with men. The green one, uh, the red one is injecting drug users, or that guess that's orange. 28 is other things. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, mostly injecting drug users spread the virus. In Latin America, a combination of other things in South and Southeast Asia, commercial sex workers. So you can see mainly spread by sex and drug use. About 5% transmission from mother to child at birth. As I said before, during birth there's lots of blood present. It's contaminated with virus and the baby picks that up. Virus is present in many body fluids. Here is a chart showing you Free virus, cell-free virus, a lot of virus in cerebral spinal fluid, so the virus gets into the CNS. There's virus in the plasma, in semen. There's also infected cells that carry virus, PBMCs, white blood cells, and semen. So in many cases, we think free virus is being transmitted, but it also may be virus-infected cells. This virus is highly unstable. It's very easy to inactivate it. It's inactivated by drying, by heating, by bleach, by alcohol, by low pH or high pH. And of course, the transmission of this virus by sex or intravenous drug use bypasses all of these constraints because it inoculates the virus directly into the next person. So it doesn't matter. None of this matters. If it were transmitted on surfaces, of course, it would be rapidly inactivated, but it's not. The fact is it's transmitted these ways that directly inoculate the virus into you, so that is the most efficient way. So it's, it's been selected to be able to do that. Here are some risks of transmission by different modes. So here, sexual transmission, female to male, from one to 700 to one in 3,000. Male to female is a higher risk. Male to male is even higher, one to 10 to one in 1,600. And here are parenteral roots if you get transfusion of infected blood, it's almost 100% transmissible. You're getting virus-infected blood injected into your veins. There's no better way to get infection than that. So the risk is 95 out of 100. And that's how so many people got infected early on in the epidemic before we realized that virus was in the blood. Needle sharing, one in 150. Needle stick, one in 200. So many healthcare workers got needle sticks when they were caring for HIV-infected patients, and they developed AIDS, but then we developed antiviral drugs, and one of the first ones, of course, was AZT. And if you get now a needle stick in a hospital, which is suspected to be HIV-contaminated, you will immediately get post-exposure prophylaxis, that's PEP, not with AZT, but with something else, and that reduces the risk to one in 10,000. So it's very effective, and that's why all health divisions and research centers have a protocol in place. If you have a needle stick in a lab that is working with HIV, you immediately go and get PEP without any testing. You just go get it and that will reduce your risk. Mother to infant is very high risk. Without any drug treatment, one in four. Just before birth, if we know the mother is infected, we can give her a dose of drug, it used to be AZT, but it's others now, that reduces the risk of transmission. It brings down the viral load in the mother, less likely to transmit to
to infants. So these are all things that are very effective, just a matter of getting them to the right people who need them. Remember from way back in lecture five, I think it was, HIV infects CD4 positive T lymphocytes. It does so by attaching to two receptors. One is the CD4 molecule shown in green in these two CD4 cells. And then of course there is a co-receptor needed. And these are chemokine receptors. There can be two kinds. It can be either CXCR4 or CCR5. And remember, you need to, the virus needs to interact with both in order to infect these cells. These are the main target cells. And these CD4 cells, of course, are hugely important in the development of an adaptive immune response. And so right away, you can see that infecting them would not be a good thing because, in fact, infection is lytic. The virus destroys these cells. And we also mentioned some time ago that we know that if you don't have the CCR5 gene, you are resistant to infection. It turns out that most of the infecting strains, when you transmit virus to another person, you're transmitting a CCR5 binding virus. Okay, not the other one, not the CXCR4. So if you have a deletion in the CCR5 gene, which is known to be present in four to 16% of certain populations, you're resistant to infection. And that's why the German AIDS patient, which we mentioned, received a bone marrow transplant from a patient, from a donor who lacked CCR5. He was cured of his AIDS, but this approach has not worked since then. Now people are trying to figure out if we could take out your bone marrow, disrupt, if you're an HIV positive person, disrupt CCR5 with CRISPR-Cas, and then put those cells back in you, would you be able to be resistant to infection? These, these are ongoing in laboratories. Let's talk now about how the infection proceeds. So you acquire virus either intravenously or by sexual activity. Here is a mucosal surface. The virus would cross the mucosal surface. It's picked up initially by dendritic cells. What we think happens, the virus binds to a protein on the surface of the dendritic cell called DC sign. And that interaction of the virus with DC sign is not, does not allow the virus to get into cells. But what happens is the, the dendritic cells, of course, get activated. They migrate to the lymph node. And there in the lymph node are all the lymphocytes that the virus needs to replicate in. So it's like a Trojan horse. The DC is inadvertently bringing the virus to the lymph node where it will then replicate. Of course, if the virus is in the blood, it can encounter CD4 cells and replicate in them. So you have an initial extensive replication in lymph nodes. The virus comes out, goes into the blood, spreads to other types of organized lymphoid tissues like the spleen, mucosal associated lymphoid tissues. You may have heard the terms GALT and MALT, gut associated lymphoid tissue, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. The virus replicates in them because they're full of CD4 positive lymphocytes. Initially, you have a high level of viremia. Virus is disseminated. Your immune response kicks in. It reduces the amount of virus, and you reach a set point, which you maintain for quite some time. The primary infection, when you first acquire virus from someone, you develop what we call an acute infection. That's shown at the left part of this graph here. You have a lot of asymptomatic primary infections, so you don't often know that you've acquired virus and the incubation time can be up to a month. So you may forget what happened to give you this infection. Here are some of the symptoms and signs that may appear. They don't all appear in these patients, and so it's very difficult to know that you have AIDS. You can have nonspecific flu-like symptoms, ulcerations, you can have swollen lymph nodes, pharyngitis, elevated liver, liver enzymes, but it takes a clever physician to put all this together. Now, if you go to a physician and you say, I have these symptoms, they will want to know, are you a drug user? Have you recently had unprotected sex? They should ask you these questions and then say, yes, we need to do a, a, an HIV test. So you have these symptoms for about 14 days. That's the primary acute infection. And then your immune system kicks in and it reduces the viremia. So on the bottom here of this graph, we're looking at HIV in plasma. So you see there's a spike 
in HIV RNA, and then it goes down to what we call the set point, which you maintain for many years. So your immune system gets it down, but it never eliminates it, so you produce virus for years and years. So that's the acute infection, and then you progress to a persistent state. You have active replication throughout the course of this disease, there are major reservoirs outside of the blood, as I said, all these lymphoreticular tissues that have lots of lymphoid cells in them. CNS, the genital tract, you make a lot of virus, 10 to the 9th produced and destroyed each day, and the half-life is less than six hours. So this is amazing that you're making so much virus, it's turning over, and that is part of the problem with using a vaccine to interrupt, as we will see. Here's a picture of gut-associated lymphoid tissue showing you what infection does. So these were taken by endoscopy, these photographs, is the intestine. In an HIV-negative person, your wall of your intestine is studded with gut-associated lymphoid tissues. These are basically lymph nodes on the wall of your intestine. They're full of lymphoid cells. And this is a healthy GI tract. And here is the GI tract of an individual who has been infected with HIV. The gut-associated lymphoid tissue is gone because it's been destroyed by virus infection. Wherever there's organized lymphoid collections, as I said, lymph nodes, GALT, virus wipes it out. That, that looks very clean, but it's not good. You should have lymphoid cells uh, in your gut. So I've just told you that you have this course of infection. You have an acute infection followed by many, many months of producing virus at a low level. And that's what we call a clinical progressor. You have your acute infection, you have many years of virus production, and eventually you progress to AIDS and die of opportunistic infections. And you can see, as we progress, the viral replication at the end increases. The CD4 counts slowly decrease until they're so low that you cannot fight off any infection and you die of pneumocystis pneumonia, candida, any number of herpes virus infections. So that's a typical progressor, but there are also two other kinetic types. There's what we call a rapid progressor, where you have that acute infection, and then within months, you progress to AIDS, so everything happens quickly. But then you have non-progressors, where there is an initial acute infection, and then you maintain a low viral load for the rest of your life, sometimes with no intervention. So Magic Johnson is an example of that. He is a non-progressor. He has not died of AIDS because he has maintained at this low set point. These individuals do contain virus at very low levels, though, but somehow they're able to control it. We call these individuals elite controllers. They have normal CD4 counts and very low copies of virus for over 10 years without getting any antiretroviral drugs. Maybe one in 300 infected people react in this way, and of course we want to know what's different about them. Maybe it will inform us in being able to control infection. And so far what we have found is this pattern of long-term survival with low levels of viruses associated with certain MHC types, B57 and B27. So you know the MHC genes are highly polymorphic in our population. We all have variable genes, but certain ones are good in terms of controlling HIV, and they're also Associate, this longevity is also associated with certain T cell responses to the GAG protein. These people do not have attenuated viruses in them. The virus is the same as it is in everyone else. That would have been nice because maybe we could take that virus and use it as a vaccine. But the virus is normal. Their immune response is apparently able to control the infection because of some of these alterations. Almost every immune cell in the body of an HIV-infected individual is dysfunctional. And of course, we've talked about CD4 positive T cells. These are infected. These are the preferred cell that are infected with virus. They're destroyed. We can produce a lot of CD4 cells. And of course, the bone marrow is involved in making the progenitors, and they come out into the bloodstream, but then the virus infects them and destroys them. And this goes on and on until you have so much virus that the CD4 population can no longer respond. But of course, CD4 T cells are important for making cytokines that are involved in developing an antibody response and that are involved in developing cytotoxic T cell response. So those two responses are affected as a consequence of destroying CD4 cells. 
T cell responses also decline. Initially, the number increases. That's associated with that early control of virus, but then their number slowly decreases. B cells are abnormal, probably because we don't have the right cytokines produced by CD4 cells. Monocytes are infected, and they are affected. Their total number goes down. Antigen presentation by both macrophages and DCs is decreased. And that means you can't fight off other infections, among everything else here. And NK cell, which remember, can detect an altered cell that's infected, their cytotoxicity decreases as well. So both an adaptive and innate immune arms are affected in AIDS, which is amazing that this virus does this. And that's eventually what overwhelms the AIDS patient, having opportunistic infections that cannot be controlled. So this summarizes all of that. We have the acute infection that I've described to you, followed by this long asymptomatic phase. But there can be symptoms sporadically, like fatigue, weight loss, lymphadenopathy, thrush. This is candida in the mouth, often happens in immunosuppressed people, an oral tumor called oral hairy leukoplakia, and shingles. You know, the reactivation of a former chickenpox, a latent chickenpox infection can be stimulated here because you're being immunosuppressed. So what has happened here in this acute phase, reservoirs have been established. Many infected cells in your body have now proviruses in them. They are, they are always regenerated, and we think that hematopoietic stem cells that give rise to all the lymphoid cells, they are latently infected, and many of those live for your lifetime. So this is why we can't clear the infection. And these cells produce virus continuously, and eventually, if you have between two and 500 CD4 cells per mil, you start to develop these <coughs> symptoms, oral lesions, shingles, low platelet count, skin cancer, headache, genital warts. If you had mycobacterium infection, tuberculosis, if you lived in, say, Europe at a certain period, you would have been latently infected, and that can be reactivated. And then when you get below 200 CD4 T cells per mil, you get a variety of protozoan, bacterial, fungal infections. You get viral infections. You get cancers. About 40% of AIDS patients develop a variety of cancers. And you also have neurological symptoms. I want to tell you just a little bit about what the virus does in the central nervous system. Here on the left is a diagram of the CNS. There's a blood vessel at the top, which is within the CNS. We've talked about viruses being able to cross from capillaries into the CNS before. So here we have some infected cells and free virus particles, infected monocytes. You can see it's getting in, it's squeezing in between endothelial cells, getting into the CNS, which is below here. We have infected CD4 cells, which can also traffic in. We know lymphocytes can traffic into the CNS. Free virus particles can get in. The virus particles that get in or that are produced by these infected cells can infect the microglia, the resident macrophage-like cells of the CNS. These are productively infected. They fuse and form giant cells. Remember syncytium formation by measles virus? Well, that can happen in the CNS. This is a cytopathic effect, the, the formation of a syncytium. These cells can produce cytokines and viral proteins, which we think are in part neurotoxic. They destroy neurons and result in some of the neurological systems of AIDS. They can also block neuropeptide transmitters from functioning properly. So all of this is responsible for the neurological aspects of AIDS. On the right is a microglial cell in the CNS, this one, which is infected. And look at all the stuff, all the compounds that are produced as a consequence of being infected. A variety of inflammatory chemokines and cytokines that are toxic. They cause toxicity to neurons and other cells. Quinolinic acid, which has been associated with CNS disease in children with AIDS. Vasoconstrictors, nitric oxide, which causes neuronal cell death. A variety of metabolites and toxic factors. So this is a response to being infected of the microglia, and the result is global neural toxicity. Many HIV patients have cancers, 40% of them. This is in part a consequence of dysregulating 
the immune response. As you may know, immune surveillance is very important for detecting tumor cells early on and eliminating them. Because the virus has destroyed the immune response, that surveillance system is gone. So we don't have surveillance and a number of tumors can form. In addition, the immune system in an AIDS patient is constantly being activated because there's always virus present. It's always being detected by T cells that get activated. They produce cytokines. So these patients are producing, as you can see in the CNS, a ton of cytokines and chemokines. You have a constant inflammatory process. Cells are always dividing. And of course, you know that's a recipe for transformation and cancer formation. A number of oncogenic viruses that we have we all have these viruses, Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus 8, human papillomaviruses. They can all be activated by this condition and lead to oncogenesis. And then finally, angiogenesis is stimulated by the compounds produced by infection. And angiogenesis allows a tumor to be vascularized so that it can grow bigger and bigger. Kaposi sarcoma was one of the cancers that made us recognize AIDS in the U.S., and as I said, this can be seen easily by these lesions on the skin, but it may not appear on the skin. It can be reflected by just internal tumors in the individual. That is older than HIV. That was described in 1872 in Hungary. And before the AIDS era, it was mainly found in older Mediterranean men, most likely because they were immunosuppressed. Because at this time, there was no AIDS virus circulating. This cancer is caused by a different virus, human herpes virus 8, which is latent in many people. And as I said in the previous slide, the immunosuppression caused by HIV infection leads to the activation of this, and it causes these Kaposi sarcomas. So you need both herpes 8 and some form of immunosuppression to develop Kaposi sarcoma. And as you age, you get immunosuppressed so you can develop it. Or if you're HIV infected, you're immunosuppressed so you can develop that as well. This happens in about 20% of infected men, 2% of infected women and transfusion recipients. So transfusions were, a, as I said, a huge way that this disease was initially spread before we recognized its presence in the, in the blood. And in particular, people who needed packed red blood cells because they can't make their own, they would get highly concentrated red blood cell preparations. And listen to this. This is really a, a pretty scary. It was a company in Miami that sold these red blood cell packs that were used in hospitals to, to treat these patients. Company in Miami, where do you think they got their blood from? Haiti. They would go to Haiti and pay donors five bucks and they would get blood. And of course, they didn't check it for HIV. So they were importing virus throughout the US by this procedure of selling packed red blood cells. You can read about that in The Origin of AIDS. All right, let, let's end up with maybe some positive news about HIV vaccines. Can we make a vaccine? So this graph shows you level of virus over time in an infection. So you can see in your acute, initial acute infection with HIV, there is a burst of virus production. And then it goes down and antiviral immunity goes up. So we think that there is a possibility that the immune response might be able to control infection. Yet the virus does persist despite having immunity and it eventually completely outstrips it. But we do know that people who are super infected, so again, sex workers who get infected continuously, it's very hard for the second and third infections to take hold. So it may be that that first infection is somewhat protected. So there have been tons of HIV vaccine trials. Just hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent all over the world. And there's only one that's, that showed any promise. And here's part of the issue. You're infected with an HIV. It has a purple glycoprotein. By the time you make antibodies to that, the virus has already changed. It undergoes antigenic drift. So now you have orange glycoproteins, which are not recognized by the purple antibodies. All right, so then your immune response kicks in and makes orange antibodies. But by then, the glycoprotein has changed again. So this happens continuously. And then, of course, at, at late AIDS, you have hardly any CD4 cells, so you can't mount an antibody response any longer, so you can't control the infection. Nevertheless, people have tried to develop vaccines because the idea is, well, 
if we can make a person immune, give them sterilizing immunity, maybe the virus will not replicate and so this won't be an issue. All right, so that makes some sense, but can we do that? This is the only trial that has shown any kind of promise and it's really very low. This is a trial carried out a number of years ago in Thailand where there are a lot of at-risk people for AIDS, sexually transmitted AIDS. 16,000 adult volunteers, they were given a two-component vaccine, one which was three viral protein coding regions, gag pollen envelope in a canary pox vector. This is a virus that infects canaries, but it doesn't make us sick. So it's a vector to deliver the proteins. And then a recombinant GP120 protein, so a subunit vaccine purified. And these individuals got six injections with the canary pox vector and six boosts with GP120. Can you imagine 16,000 people making sure they get back for 12 of these injections? It's just a logistical nightmare. You have to have an entire organization from top to bottom to take care of this. Plus you have to tell them do not, you have to practice safe sex. You have to give them condoms and tell them to use them, but you're hoping they won't. Otherwise your data are useless if nobody gets infected. So in this trial of 16,000 people, those were the numbers of AIDS infections that occurred in the trial. The control group that didn't get vaccine, there were 74 new infections. And the vaccine group, there were 51. So there were 20 fewer. So that's a, an efficacy rate of 30%. That's almost placebo rate. It's really nothing, and this would never be licensed. Another approach which is promising is to use broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. And a number of these have been identified in people. So you can now take an HIV infected person, clone out their B cells and clone out the antibody genes and say which are directed against HIV. And then you can find some that are broadly neutralizing, which means they neutralize all the subtypes, right? A, B, C, et cetera, that I showed you earlier. These antibodies are shown on this picture. This is a picture of the glycoprotein, the viral glycoprotein. So the viral membrane is at the top. The glycoprotein is in the gray KG image. And it's, this is what would be attaching to the cell receptor. And all these colored molecules are different monoclonal antibodies that have been I identified in infected people and which are broadly neutralizing. So they will neutralize many subtypes. So this would be like a passive therapy. Maybe if you could catch an infection early enough, you might be able to treat people with this. That's hard. I think the reservoirs get established very early on in a few weeks in infection, so you don't have a big window in which to treat. But another approach has been done by David Baltimore's lab. He said the last thing he's gonna do in science is test this AIDS vaccine. So what he's done is he took one of those broadly neutralizing antibodies and put the genes for it in an adeno-associated virus vector. Adeno-associated viruses have a single-stranded genome. Here's the immunoglobulin heavy and light chains. They're both produced, so you infect mice with these. You use mice that have received the human immune system so that HIV can replicate in it. You put this vector in them. They make the broadly neutralizing antibodies for their entire life because AAV is a vector that stays with you forever. And then they challenge these mice with HIV. So that's what's on the right here. On the top, we're looking at HIV RNA copies per mill of plasma. So the red lines are the mice that got the vector with the broadly neutralizing antibody. And they challenge these mice with virus every week. They infect them every week with HIV. One, two, three, four, all the way up to 21 challenges. And these mice are never infected. This little blip here at week one, but they're all blocking infection because they're continuously making this broadly neutralizing antibody. And you can see the control mice are all getting infected. On the bottom is the percent uninfected. The, the mice that received the vector red line, they remain uninfected despite 21 weekly challenges. And of course, the other animals all eventually get infected. Interesting, it takes 18 infections to infect these mice. So it's not a great model for human infection. Nevertheless, this seems to be protective. So this is in phase one which is a safety test in humans.
I just don't know if it's going to be good for you to make pretty high levels of antibody. These, an, these mice are making grams of antibody per mil of serum. I'm not sure that's good for people, but we'll see. So if you could make a cocktail of broadly neutralizing antibodies that would protect against infection, this should block infection completely. You're not going to establish a reservoir. This could work. However, this is the obstacle as I see it. These are phylogenetic trees showing you viral diversity based on genome sequences. There is global influenza in 1996. Below it is a single individual who's been infected for six years. As much viral diversity as you see globally in one year of influenza virus. That's how much the virus changed. This is the HIVs in Amsterdam a group of patients in 1991. So the Patients have a greater diversity than a single. But this is the amazing one. This is the diversity of all the HIV in the Congo in 1997 compared with influenza virus. So you could get infected with any of these viruses. And your vaccine, whatever it is, would have to block infection with any one of those. That is a tall order because none of the broadly neutralizing monoclonals could probably handle all of that. So that's why I think a conventional vaccine is unlikely to work. And there are some other approaches uh, that are being discussed. Really, the best approach is not to get infected. We know this can be done. But many people choose not to, to go that route. So this has been really a remarkable story summarized here. 1921, a, a chimp virus was passed to patient zero. That one patient, most likely one patient, has spread the virus to enough other people such that today we have had a total of 78 million infections and 35 million deaths, all starting with a single crossover, really emphasizing how emerging viruses can spread undetected until it's really too late. Next time, we're going to talk about using viruses for the good. We're going to talk about viral vectors in which you can put therapeutic genes, vaccines, and so forth. It'll be a good way to, to end up this course.